Uh, welcome to the final uh, speaker event in both this semester and this academic year's uh, Social Studies of Information Research Group speaker series. Before we get started, a little uh, legalese to read. This event will be recorded, or is being recorded, uh, streamed and or podcast. Video recordings will only capture the speaker and the students or the attendees will not be visible. Your voice, however, may be captured if you ask a question. If you do not wish your voice to be captured, please speak to me uh, in advance so we can determine an alternate means for you to participate. Or feel free to write down a question and pass it to one of, one of us or a staff member who can read it for you. Okay, with that out of the way, um, I'm happy today we have two uh, dissertators, PhD candidates, from different departments on campus here at UWM talking about their dissertation research. As far as the format for today, uh, both speakers will talk for about 30 minutes and then afterwards we'll have a question and answer session to discuss their talks. To start off with, uh, Diane Bellscamper, standing on my right, will present Good Girls and Better Consumers the functions of teen magazines in American girl culture of the 1960s. <laughs> oh, go ahead. All right. And uh, just slightly uh, to interpose myself here, uh, <laughs> this talk is sponsored by the research group in SOAS, uh, the research group for the social studies of information, which is intended to be this kind of broad interdisciplinary space where people who have research interests that relate in some way or another to uh, studying information phenomena from the point of view of the social sciences or humanities uh, can get together. Um, we offer uh, several things that are attractive, but particularly to graduate students. We have some conference uh, travel funds available, and we hope we've included them in our budget for next year, so we hope we'll have them for next year too. We also have some money to assist graduate students involved with the group with membership of professional societies. So uh, anyone who can find any of that appealing should make sure that they get an art mailing list and encourage uh, everyone to become more involved with the group next year when we'll be further ramping up our activities. Thank you. Uh, so introduce, to introduce Diana, uh, she is a dissertator in the Department of History here at UWM. Her research interests are girlhood culture, popular music, consumer culture, and media in the Cold War era, as well as the intersections between them. She holds a BA in history and English, and an MA in, the, in United States history, both from Marquette. And her published works include articles in the Journal of Girlhood Studies and the Encyclopedia of American Women's History. She also researches and writes sports and culture entries for the forthcoming print and digital editions of the Encyclopedia of Milwaukee. In addition to research, writing, and consulting, she has created and taught courses for UWM, MATC, Marion University, and Marquette University. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the premise of my research in popular culture is that culture is an expression and not an explanation of the social and political context that surround it. My research, as Ed pointed out, focuses on the intersections of popular music, girlhood, consumerism, and mass media of the 20th century, most particularly the eras after World War II and of the Cold War. This presentation is a brief glimpse of my dissertation research on teen magazines of the 1960s, ultimately looking at the material culture of girls' lives and how magazines specifically function within girl culture of the Cold War era. Social and cultural historians generally agree that teenagers were identified as a targeted market within American cult consumer culture in the years following World War II. In these years of the baby boom, youth culture blossomed amidst economic prosperity and a much more cohesive peer culture. This adolescent youth culture raised concerns among social critics who feared that decreased parental authority would lead to generations of delinquents and opened the door for subversive ideologies and activities during the Cold War era. The producers of America's most popular teen magazines at this time created publications intended to stave off subversive influences while encouraging consumer practices and defending democratic ideals, 
incorporating what they called responsible consumerism within youth culture. Advertisers and editorial staffs of popular magazines reflected and cultivated a unique girls' culture within the context of consumer culture and perceptions of idealized femininity during the 1950s and 60s. By doing so, these producers encouraged young females to become not only ideal girls, but ideal consumers as well. The sense of civic duty and the responsibility to uphold American ideals were reflected in the model of the civic consumer, notably espoused and represented in the pages of Seventeen magazine. However, other magazines tailored this model for their own purposes, including Sixteen magazine. This paper will provide analysis of how the producers of Seventeen and Sixteen Magazine perceived their audiences and used the language, columns, and features within their pages to cultivate good girls and better consumers in the Cold War era. The figure, both symbolic and literal, of the teenage girl was at the center of convergence for several major developments during the 20th century, especially the promotion of a popular media culture, cultural challenges to conventions regarding gender and sexuality, and the evolution of a consumer culture which focused on demographic, identity, and taste distinctions. These developments emerged gradually in the early decades of the century, but attained a visible and dominant influence in the 1950s and 1960s. During these decades, teenagers became an extremely valuable and volatile peer group promoted by the media, analyzed by institutional figureheads, courted by advertisers, and criticized by all three sectors. The malleable, undecipherable teenager, treated as a stereotype and stripped of individuality by society at large, was a culturally engaged consumer, armed with disposable income and erratic tastes, who had matured beyond the subject of authoritative decisions of parents, but had not yet fully emerged as a socially responsible adult. The instability of the teenager's interests and identity, contextualized by a culture that highly valued America's youth as the hopeful bearers of a safe and strong American democracy of the future, led major cultural producers to focus on the teen demographic as their primary audience, analytical subjects, and profit generators. However, the teenage girl was the most lucrative subject for these producers, as her role in a rapidly changing and socially unstable American culture was most critical and highly contested. Cultural producers represented and interpreted the symbolic figure of the teenage girl as a confused, frenetic, white, middle-class, young female with all of the broader connotations associated with those terms. She was beyond the toys and carefree whims of childhood, but not yet savvy with the duties and responsibilities of womanhood. Her socially fractured figure was dispersed between her age-determined student and daughter roles and her gender-determined social roles as a confidant and a date for her female and male peers, respectively. In the midst of this disjunction, she was also in training to become a civic consumer, a future wife and mother struggling to comprehend the duties and responsibilities that defined these roles in an ever-changing social context permeated with fears of deviance and subversion. Her literal figure, her physical body, was highly contested as well, with her physical development on display and emerging sexuality simultaneously encouraged and contained by the culture around her. Her physique, her clothing, and the beauty products she used accentuated her socially and culturally enforced femininity, yet the social conventions that urged restraint in romantic relationships frowned upon her sexual maturation. The popular media promoted and perpetuated the chaos that surrounded the teenage girl, while it courted her as a young buyer of goods, which would ease her domestic responsibilities and signify her individual tastes while she engaged in leisure and entertainment activities. Teen fashion and music magazines specifically addressed a girl audience and highlighted the obstacles and concerns these girls would face in their newly discovered worlds of adolescence and consumer culture. Magazines such as Seventeen and Sixteen Magazine also facilitated the creation of a space for readers to share their feelings, concerns, and dreams while encouraging a youth consumer culture and allowed their readers' agency in creating this imagined sp space. Though these magazines shared many characteristics, there are significant differences between them as well. Most notably, 
Seventeen was primarily a fashion magazine, whereas Sixteen magazine was a celebrity fan magazine that focused on pop music and television stars. The greater percentage of Seventeen's revenue was supplied by advertisers, while Gloria Stavers, the editor of Sixteen magazine, refused advertising from outside sources in her magazine. The implications of these differences will be considered as part of how these magazines' producers perceived and addressed their readers, girls who comprised a highly desired target consumer market during the Cold War era. Seventeen debuted in September of 1944 and quickly had a significant impact on the youth market and in shaping teenage trends. Within five years, its audience exceeded three million readers every month. The magazine claimed to be the voice of the aggregate population of teenage girls and declared itself the cultural mediator between the stereotypical American teenage girl and advertisers, manufacturers, and the mass media in general, despite the fact that its audience was mostly white middle class girls. Seventeen appealed to teenage girls because it was created specifically for them and addressed their interests and concerns. It appealed to advertisers because it brought them a consistent audience of teenage consumers. Seventeen initiated this relationship after creating a campaign to assess teenage opinions, tastes, and buying habits, and presenting advertisers with an audience perceived as, quote, capable, reliable, potential consumers who had a vital interest in learning how to shop, end quote. <laughs> Advertising agencies soon produced specialized copy for Seventeen recognizing the influence the magazine had within teenage culture. According to a Seventeen promotional director, an ad that worked in Vogue, for instance, would not suit the wholesome, fresh-faced girls who read Seventeen. Meanwhile, the editors carefully shaped teenage tastes along conventional middle-class lines, which reflected the magazine's audience. Editor Helen Valentine championed the teenage desire for personal freedom but always in the context of personal responsibility. And her editorial tone was that of a friendly yet concerned older sister. In each monthly issue, Seventeen offered many courses in home economics and notes on where teenagers could buy the products they needed to put those plans into action. The magazine also provided tips and regimens for grooming, dieting, and fashion that not only took the worry out of teenage life, but introduced young readers to products and manufacturers that promised to solve their problems. The magazine was highly influential as a mediator between marketers and consumers. Seventeen developed the image of a teenage girl as a consumer of the magazine and the products advertised within its covers, but also as a member of society. The editors and publishers of Seventeen espoused the idea of civic consumerism combining one's democratic role as an active citizen with one's duty as a responsible and active consumer. <coughs> Just as Seventeen's staff negotiated with its advertisers, it also negotiated with readers, responding to them but ultimately controlling the final product with a desire to help girls forge their own way through their problems and the world and, at the same time, a wish to communicate directly with girls as responsible <coughs> young women. This civic consumerism could be identified through the features in the magazine, which cultivated insecurity and the constant need for personal improvement, similar to its advertising content, but also recommended books on inflation, atomic energy, offered articles on politics and world affairs, and encouraged its readers to take responsibility for themselves and become active, questioning citizens. Seventeen's producers encouraged their readers to be not only ideal girls, but also ideal Americans <coughs> through the practices of consumerism. Seventeen's approach to its audience suited both ideals, as it taught, quote, inexperienced consumers the fine points of intelligent buying, how to devise a budget and live within it, how to evaluate, quote, quality and price, and how to distinguish the important differences between short-term style and long-term satisfaction, end quote. This satisfaction was usually depicted as productive domestic futures, complete with college educations, diamond engagement rings, silver tea sets, and hope chests. <coughs> satisfaction was a prominent theme in another popular teen magazine of the Cold War era, Sixteen Magazine. However, the satisfaction that Sixteen promoted was less focused on traditional concepts of consumerism 
and more focused on cultivating a dreamsville for its readers, replete with attractive young men, hip music stars, trendy fashions, and what were known as secret sisters, who would assist teenage girls during their journey. Given its significant readership, Sixteen Magazine was another publication that was highly influential as a mediator between marketers and consumers. However, Sixteen Magazine did not accept advertising from outside marketers, which required more subtle forms of consumer cultivation and greater influence from its very popular editor, Gloria Stavers. Sixteen Magazine was the most popular teen-oriented celebrity magazine in America catering to a readership consisting primarily of <coughs> preteen and teenage girls while reinforcing social norms and conventions. Whereas Seventeen's features generally address the latest fashions and commentary on contemporary social issues while cultivating a readership of girls in their later teens, Sixteen magazines sought that slightly younger audience and featured popular music and television stars rather than fashions. Seventeen served as a guide for teenage girls in negotiating their roles as fashionable students, future wives and mothers, and responsible citizens, while becoming consumers who enhance their femininity and individual style <coughs> through a wide variety of advertised goods. Sixteen magazine also reinforced the dominant cultural norms regarding female gender roles, yet presented the ideologies in features that presented appropriate images and behaviors under the guise of celebrity advice and endorsements without the influence of outside corporate advertising. Sixteen Magazine debuted in May 1957 and in its earliest issues was subtitled The Magazine for Smart Girls, with, according to its publishers, its only product being fantasy. It has, in fact, been called the first magazine to capture that fantastical celebrity magic for a very specific teenage audience by some of its um, associate editors. By the mid-1960s, simultaneous with the popularity of the Beatles and the Monkees, 16 average sales of over 1 million copies per issue. However, many more readers were exposed to 16 every month. That one million sales figure didn't take into account the popular pass-along readership factor. And the magazine brazenly bragged on its masthead, 16 is the top favorite of over 7 million readers. Gloria Stavers realized that, rather than a mere fan magazine, her readers were searching for a space in which they could not only read about their favorite stars, but also express their own feelings about these stars and much more. She paid very close attention to the letters from fans, <coughs> once noting the readers cared about the things they could relate to. How old was the performer? Did he have a girlfriend? What did he eat for breakfast? What was his favorite TV show? The concept behind Gloria Staver's 16 was that of a private sphere that brought together femininity, leisure, and consumerism while focusing on style, fashion, and pop music. Stavers, the editor of Sixteen from 1958 until 1950, excuse me, 1975, determined how the magazine represented the fractured figure of the teenage girl and which celebrities were used as models for the variant roles. <coughs> Stavers identified and represented a normative girl culture and utilized the features in Sixteen to expound upon these views. It opened up opportunities for girls to express their individuality and concerns in a positive and reassuring forum. Stavers expressed a genuine concern for her magazine's readers and their struggles in wrestling with these conflicting expectations placed upon them in an interview that was featured in a 1967 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. In this feature, Stavers explained her motivation for including such a great amount of advice content in a pop celebrity magazine. Quote, the problems the readers have are so simple they bring tears to my eyes. A lot of parents today are young, too, and many of them never seem to take the time to explain the little things that really matter. I get letters from girls who cry themselves to sleep every night because they're so much in love with one monkey or another. <laughs> Their parents think it's silly or simply don't believe them. Well, I believe them, and I know what they're going through. It hurts. We try to help. End quote. In the early 1960s, female stars such as Connie Francis and Leslie Gore were featured as secret sisters 
whose advice columns revealed the keys to gaining popularity, dealing with parents, and expressing interest in a boy. If those bits of advice were not enough, Sixteen offered numerous publications that could assist a girl in her attempts to become an ideal girl, including the perpetually promoted Sixteen's Popularity and Beauty book. The names and likenesses of the secret sisters, who provided advice in the magazine, lent credibility as models for ideal girls and, if anything, encouraged some conformity rather than individualism. Readers learned from female fashion icons, such as Shelley Fabre and Cher, what signifiers would be useful in attracting the right boys. Later, after the magazine and teenage culture were overwhelmingly influenced by British trends, features on how to look like a Beatles girlfriend were interspersed with advice columns from popular British models, such as Patty Boyd, Jill Stewart, and Twiggy, on how to adapt their style to an appropriate style for teenage girls. Perhaps the most unique aspect of Gloria Stavers and Sixteen's influence on teenage consumer culture was that the magazine did not publish outside advertising. The magazine's profits were generated solely from its newsstand sales, subscriptions, and affiliated publications. As Gloria Stavers cultivated new generations of consumers, she did so without the influence of any outside companies with vested interests in selling their products, aside from the obvious influence of music promoters. The considerable monthly circulation indicates that teenage girls were very receptive to the space created for them by Miss Stavers. They were able to dream and fantasize about their favorites without intrusion from corporate outsiders, and they were encouraged to do so with content directed and created by a woman who had been there and understood their concerns, as Helen Valentine did with Seventeen. Stavers once stated, quote, Girls from 10 to 15 are in a period of development more intense than any other period in their lives. By the time a girl actually reaches the age of 16, she's ready to leave the dream world, and 16 Magazine is way behind her. But during those earlier years, I tell you true, that child is mine." <laughs> End quote. Staver's perception that she was serving as a mother figure to her readers is crucial when analyzing the depictions of female celebrities in Sixteen Magazine. Referring to her readers as, quote, the future mothers of America, end quote, Stavers ultimately acknowledged her goal of training girls to exhibit traits that would ensure their roles in the normative American society of the Cold War era. Stavers gained her readers' trust and confidence through her direct approach of communicating with them in her letters and columns, 16's positive depictions of female celebrities, and consistent reinforcement of the ways in which her readers could become unique and popular individuals. However, Stavers astutely recognized that a generic representation of the conformist teenage girl was insufficient during an era of major social change, and aware of the age cohort of the magazine's audience, included diverse depictions of the possible roles teenage girls could have and which younger readers could anxiously aspire to fulfill. The diversity in such depictions became very apparent in 1964, as the British invasion of musician, musicians, models, and actors swept across the Atlantic and into American youth and popular culture. The Beatles' arrival in America in February of 1964 initiated the influence of British popular culture on American youth, permeating the popular media that targeted youth at a steady pace until roughly 1967, when acts such as the Beatles and the Rolling Stones began experimenting with psychedelic music and exhibiting eccentric behaviors that suggested an affinity for countercultural ideologies. This afforded an opportunity for American acts such as the Monkees, Paul Revere and the Raiders, and the Mamas and the Papas to, become, to begin reclaiming some territory on the top 40 charts and television screens as well as in teen magazines. This is not to say, however, that only British acts were featured in 16 between 1964 and 67. Rather, during this period, a distinct trend emerged that reinforced broader social and political constructions of the era, specifically the fractured alliance of British and American interests in the midst of the Cold War yeah. era. If we understand that the United States pursued a distinct yet complementary political and social agenda to those of the European Western powers, especially England, during this era, we must refocus our analytical lens to assess the influence of the British invasion on American youth culture. 
In such an analysis, the fractured depictions of female celebrities and femininity in general in Sixteen Magazine during the mid-1960s emerges as one type of cultural production that helped to make meaning of the strategic separation of British and American interests during this era. Clear distinctions in the representations of British and American female celebrities underscore this strategic separation between the two. The British birds and American sisters who were featured in the pages of 16 subtly represented the fractured alliance within the West while prominently representing the fractured femininity pervasive in American girlhood. The terminology used to describe these young women is indicative of the fractured feminine roles represented in popular culture. When we think of birds, colorful, graceful animals sought by interested watchers, uniquely identified by their distinct image, vis visual image, and audible utterances, characteristics discernible only by knowledgeable observers. Such descriptions align with the functions of the British birds in representations of femininity in Sixteen magazine. The British female celebrities depicted in the magazine were the focal points of style or image features. Those which illuminated fashion trends, beauty tips, and other superficial ways in which a girl could lure a boy or signify her styles and interests. In addition, these birds deciphered British lingo, identified regional dialects, and explained in simplistic terms the youth revolution occurring in England during this era. Sixteen Magazine's representations of British women during this period focused on those who were married or closely linked romantically with prominent musicians. Rare were the features that included single adult women. Patty Boyd, who you saw before, was the girlfriend of George Harrison. Jane Asher was the girlfriend of Paul McCartney. When single British women were represented, their behavior was identified as wild or mad, clearly not the type of behavior a young American girl would want to emulate. When we think of sisters, Female siblings who are inextricably linked to their familial peers, traits and idiosyncrasies determined by genetic codes, supportive female models who display behaviors to be emulated, confidants who by virtue of their generational position in a family are subject to the authority of parents. These descriptions take on additional significance if we consider the representation of the nuclear family during the Cold War era as a metaphor for the society steeled against subversive influence. Again, these descriptions align with the functions of American secret sisters in representations of femininity in Sixteen magazine. The American female celebrities depicted in the magazine were the focal points of behavior features, how to act, those which reinforced appropriate actions, thoughts, and relationships. Advice columns, day in the life pictorials, and personal exhortations about boys and life goals can be counted among these features. In essence, while the birds provided advice on superficial images that could be tried on and put on display, the sisters gave instruction on how to mature into a responsible American woman. In the rare instances when American stars were featured in beauty columns, two trends emerge. They are cited as beautiful on the inside due to their socially normative behaviors, and or they endorse specific brands of beauty products within their columns, reinforcing the importance of being a responsible consumer. The American Secret Sisters were young women who were famous for their own careers in entertainment industries, usually as singers or actresses. However, the careers themselves very rarely figured into their representations. Yes, they were famous because of their top 40 songs or popular television shows, but their careers had very little to do with their functions in the magazine. Connie Francis was not giving advice on social etiquette and relationships because she was a singer. Sally Field did not advise girls on how to act around boys because she was an actress. Their careers were secondary to their roles as sisters in the imagined community of American girlhood. Along with Frances and Field, the most frequently featured American female celebrities were actresses Patty Duke and Shelley Fabre and singer Leslie Gore. In features such as How You Can Be Patty Duke's Best Friend, Shelley's Wedding Day, and Leslie Gore's advice features, You Don't Have to Be Left Out and How to Make the Most of Yourself, 
American sisters provided advice on how to embrace and exhibit stereotypically feminine traits and behaviors to become socially accepted. However, no sister received more coverage in Sixteen Magazine than Cher, both as an individual and as the wife and singing partner of Sonny Bono. Cher was the credited author of an advice column for over two years, which is a long period of time in one of these magazines. Many of those columns also featured Sonny as a co-author. The significance of this is not lost. As one of the few prominently married female celebrities of the era, Cher could expound on the roles and responsibilities of being a young wife and mother with credibility. In the first installment of her monthly column, Cher addresses her readers directly. Quote, I, Cher, promise you that I will do all I can to help and guide you in every way possible in your day-to-day -day life. I just emerged from my early teens, and I know what unhappiness and suffering a young girl often goes through, and all too often has to go through alone. Well, you aren't alone anymore. I'm here. You can count on me, and I will not fail you." End quote. In another rare instance, when an American sister was included in a beauty feature, the young woman's inherent traits and behaviors were the focus of the article. In Michelle, All American Beauty, Singer Michelle Phillips' image is secondary to her behavior. Quote, the Michelle look is not just a look, it is a way, too. A way of walking, speaking, listening, seeing, and living. In proper instructional form, the passage continues, quote, but let's take it all one thing at a time so that you can absorb it and be able to put your knowledge to work later, end quote. After a brief account of Michelle's beauty routine, the article refocuses on how, quote, Michelle went about trying to improve her life. She found that if she would stop thinking of herself and her problems and really listen to others and take an interest in them, that those others soon became truly interested in her and wanted her for a friend. It was really quite simple. One just had to quit being selfish, dwelling on oneself, and being introverted." End quote. So the fractured feminine roles represented in Sixteen Magazine included those of sisterly confidant, responsible consumer, and future wife and mother. All of these roles required negotiation and appropriate visual representation depending upon the specific situation in which a girl found herself at any given time. While a girl's personal style and taste might encourage her to temporarily experiment with various images, utilizing those kicky fab fashions or mod makeup, her true character would be revealed in her behavior. Thus, while the British birds could suggest visual signifiers that a girl may favor, responsible girls who sought to participate in and be accepted by American society were encouraged to emulate the behaviors of their American sisters. In short, conforming to social expectations and pursuing a path towards marriage would assure a girl of embodying the true all-American beauty of Mary Michelle Phillips. As Leslie Gore advised in November 1964, when you present yourself to others for their approval and acceptance, you must give them something worth wanting to accept. In essence, Gloria Stavers used the pages of Sixteen Magazine to encourage teenage girls to become consumers. This was not only encouraged the sale of the magazine, but of the artist's recordings, films, etc., and any other products affiliated with them. Stavers' logic was clear. As long as the stars stayed popular, her magazine would sell, and the artists, recognizing the influence of Sixteen on their popularity, would continue to offer exclusive features, perpetuating that consumer cycle. Peter Noon, lead singer of Herman's Hermits and a very popular Sixteen fave Ray, explained how Stavers depicted the stars in her magazine and revealed the crucial factor in Stavers' motivations. Quote, we showed up in Sixteen in all sorts of intimate photos, but never with groupies that were hanging around. Gloria wouldn't take that kind of picture because she believed that every girl, every reader, owned me. That girl, that 16 reader, was somebody to be protected. You couldn't hurt her. That's what Gloria always taught us. She was the pr protectress of this little flock of children. 16 always respected the fans, and so did I." End quote. In the midst of the Cold War, Teen magazines played influential roles in teen girl culture. The producers of these magazines crafted their product to instill consumer ethics in their readers, as well as the values of responsibility, independent thinking, and creativity. Teen magazines such as Seventeen and Sixteen Magazine 
clearly conformed to the American ideals of consumerism that were pervasive in the Cold War era. While Helen Valentine in 17 attempted to cultivate civic consumers, Gloria Stavers in 16 magazine encouraged girls to explore their dreamsville, not only through fantasy, but through consumerism as well. Through their respective methods and goals, 17 and 16 magazine both sought to cultivate generations of good girls and better consumers. take two minutes to do this. any of that in terms of information? No. Now, if you, if you did try and do that, are there any ways in which you think thinking of any of this as being uh, involving, for example, inf information-based practices, the communication of information, information institutions, might help in understanding that kind of history? I never put it in those terms. Um, I think the fact that one of the one of the elements that it, it intrigues me about magazines, especially, is that they are mass marketed and that they're considered disposable. And there is something about that where people hang on to these. People have collections of them. There are, you know, private collectors that pride themselves in their collections of, say, a certain magazine, but. Research institutions don't value them in the same way. And the reason I say that is because Seventeen Magazine is considered, you know, kind of iconic in women's culture, in girl culture, in media culture for its unique kind of position as the first teen magazine. Sixteen Magazine, not at all. There is no archive of it. And that's what drew me to Sixteen, is because it had a significant readership, it's communicating information to millions of readers, both boys and girls. Obviously, I'm focusing on girl culture, but there are a lot of young men who read it, well, who've talked to me, who have read it. <laughs> and, you know, gleaned an understanding of sort of consumer life and girls' life through that. Um, but it's that disposable factor, that it was considered insignificant, that it was considered um, to be just, you know, something that kids read and tossed away and they forgot about it. Well, they haven't forgotten about it. And I'm probably not answering your question directly, but the way I look at the impact that those trends and those effects had, and it's in the way that the readers described the editor. Um, if you look today, there are websites, you know, Facebook pages, all these things devoted Sure, to the celebrities, but to the editor. Their allegiance is to Gloria Stavers, more so than it is to the artists themselves. So I'm not well versed in, um, you know, kind of the direct questions that you're asking me. Um, I don't know if maybe you could rephrase it a little bit, given given kind of my perception of, of that sort of information, or we have someone behind you who is raising a hand as well. Very briefly, I mean, information, I think, is appealing in large part because it's such an extremely vague kind of concept. That, yeah. That we cover so many different kinds of approaches. I think some things that you might consider following up on, uh, that you might pass some reference to, um, would be to think through more what it means um, to, uh, to 
to conceptualize this as an imagined community. You know? um, and information in the sense of kind of communication schools as mediation. So you've got this, you, you know, so as a historian, you look at the sources, you kind of read them, um, but then to kind of think through more, you know, what, uh, not just the content of what's being mediated, you know, but the process um, and the experience. And in general, you know, whenever people read those kinds of cultural sources, I personally always find it more compelling if they have a way of not just, you know, trying to judge from the printed source itself what, what the reaction and experience was, but to kind of triangulate it from, you know, oral history interviews or mm -hmm. kind of other media or, you know, diaries or, you know, any, anything that kind of lets you actually get to the readers more directly and not be yourself in a position of kind of being part of this imagined community mm -hmm. that experiences it only through the print. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, I mean, that's. But but I, I was interested when you made your presentation about but briefly there about social science and um, and information because um, I'm a cultural historian um, like Diana and I'm, I was wondering um, partly why why Diana was you know, invited so uh, but how how does the field of information studies conceptualize culture because a great deal is being communicated, a great deal of information is involved in <clears throat> a lot of cultural objects that has, that's not, for one, not clearly intentional on the part of the sort of message constructor, nor is it received rationally or directly or consciously by the, the cultural consumer. So there's a lot of information that's there that's about reproduction of culture, but it's not, no one sort of is, sort of, it's part of your everyday life. So how do, how do information studies people think of that sort of intangibility? So is that a question for me? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming there are other people, uh, other people here who are sort of like, you know, I, 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 I think it would be interesting to hear from Ed as well. Uh, spe speaking personally, I see myself primarily as a social historian of technology mm -hmm. um, with Active participation in business history and um, science studies. Mm -hmm. So I distinguish there between library and information science, which has tended to have kind of rather a narrow kind of professional school kind of agenda, and the broader field of information studies and I schools, which is supposed to be about bringing in other kinds of disciplinary perspectives. <coughs> that raises the problem. You might have a bunch of people sitting in the same school who don't actually have very much in common, which you know is the other danger. Uh, so it's probably hard to generalize about how information people would see that. I personally actually think that an approach that I myself don't know about as much about, I should be very helpful about, that, is that kind of like German materiality, um, media studies, you know, kind of Kittler and things, mm -hmm. um, that, that is kind of trying to integrate the study of the, um, well, to use the jargon, affordances and, you know, constraints of materiality and the technologies you know, into the story of the culture that is being mediated through them. Um, and I know some people in high schools are into that kind of thing, although I'm not sure if anyone in this particular one is. Ed, uh, can you bring up perspective? Yeah, um, I, I come at things from more of an archival theory perspective, where a lot of what, what I'm interested in looks at, well, part of it looks at what I would call accidental archives. Um, people who are generating the, these lasting, or what could potentially be lasting, um, records of uh, very informal groups, organizations, uh, social structures, but they don't realize that these are important records for future researchers. And going out and identifying and working with those people um, from, from a cultural perspective so th this could be anything from, from blogs and trying to capture that information to, uh, bless you, to nonprofit organizations that just have a web presence or listservs. It, it, it's a different approach because now we're talking more electronic media, but I still think it's, it's these are records that are being created without really that permanent mindset. Um, and trying to reinterpret them 
through the lens of information resources, cultural identity, things like that. <laughs> it's towards it? Yes, yeah, no, that, that helps. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, let's move on to our second speaker today. Now that we have the, the smart board back up and running. And our second speaker, Lindsay Harness, comes to us way of the communication department here at UWM and will be talking, uh, or will present a talk called The Myth of the Happy Gay, a critical analysis of the It Gets Better YouTube narratives. Lindsay is a doctoral candidate in the communications department, as I mentioned. Her research interests focus on critically analyzing the uh, rhetorical interdependence between technology, especially social media, and identity construction, particularly for marginalized populations during times of social crises. At present, she's a full-time learning technology consultant here at UWM's LTC, Learning Technology Center, where she assists faculty and staff in developing sound pedagogical practices for using learning technologies in educational context. This position contributes to our understanding regarding the influence of technology and personal, professional, and civic engagement. In addition to her current role, she has also taught communication courses at Missouri State University, Carroll University, and at UW-Milwaukee, and has several publications regarding different aspects of technology. Lindsay? It's always weird writing your own bio. Yeah. <laughs> and then you hear it and you're like, yes, I wrote that. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Lindsay. Thank you for all being here. On September 9th, 2010, in the small rural town of Greensburg, Indiana, a mother walked into her family barn and found her son hanging from the rafters. The teen had hanged himself after being incessantly bullied. In the aftermath of his highly publicized death, acquaintances of Billy painted the picture of a boy who was fighting always against bullying for being gay. Although the 15-year-old had yet to reveal his sexual status to anyone, his peers still called him names and implied his life was not worth living because he seemed different. One of the fellow students stated, people would call him a fag and stuff like that. Just make fun of him because he's different, basically. They said stuff like, you're like a piece of crap and you don't deserve to live. Billy's constant ridicule was not a surprise to anyone. In fact, many people knew he was being bullied. Uh, there have been reports of it. People have complained. The authorities in the school have been notified, and yet nothing was done. It just continued. Billy's death was just the beginning of what would become come to be seen by many to be a near and a serious epidemic. Following Billy's suicide, in a span of 14 days, Cody Parker, Seth Walsh, Tyler Clemente, and Asher Brown also took their own lives in separate acts of suicide. Each had suffered years of verbal and physical attacks for being gay. The string of suicides in a very short amount of time elicited widespread attention. Dan Savage, a syndicated sex columnist and gay rights activist, stated when a 15-year-old kills himself, what he's saying is he can't picture a future that is decent enough and happy enough to stick around for. The reason for this, the LGBT population concluded in the aftermath of these suicides is that youth are without the positive message they need in order to get through the victimization that they experience in their adolescent years. There needed to be a way to help these youth plagued by social prejudices. It was clear that ending anti-gay bullying was imperative for lasting social change, but it would take time that the LGBT youth simply could not afford. That intervention needed to be sooner than later. So on September 21st, 2010, along with his husband, Terry Miller, Dan Savage hoped to provide a more immediate solution to the arguably rising epidemic of LGBT youth suicides. Utilizing the ever popular and accessible uh, medium known as YouTube, both men created and shared a message to LGBT youth, encouraging them to have hope despite the pain and discrimination they face every day. In a little over eight minutes, and with simplistic technological features, Savage and Miller share a narrative of their past and present lives as gay men in a society dominated by heterosexuality. They offer personalized accounts of past victimization and provide evidence of the better life that awaited them as adults. 
The aim of the video is to offer a genuine portrayal of the possibility that a better future for LGBT youth can happen and will happen. So known as the It Gets Better Project, the goal of the campaign is to provide countless young adults with hope and inspiration. Um, Dan Savage and Tele Terry Miller, after their first video, call upon other LGBT adults to offer the hope and inspiration they wish they had when they were youth. They ask them to make similar videos, videos which tell them about their past lives as well as their present lives. Now, when this first came out, the video, um, the Dan and Terry video, they were afraid that it wouldn't go anywhere. They were afraid that it would just be one video. And then videos came, came streaming in, especially after Tyler Clemente's uh, suicide. And within just a matter of days, there was 100 videos. There were so many emails that Dan Savage's computer crashed. Um, Google gave them uh, more space. YouTube gave them more space than uh, was allowed by anyone. And so they went and tried to figure out a way in which more videos could be coming in. And I state all this to uh, provide evidence that this campaign became very persuasive, it became very popular, and it became very popular and persuasive quickly. So as Ed mentioned, uh, the research I'm gonna present to you today is part of my dissertation. Um, it's going to be a snippet of it, um, and, uh, and then it will leave time for questions. And Ed, if you don't mind, when it gets to about 15 minutes, let me know. Um, so my focus for this dissertation is that I want to analyze the It Gets Better Project's message as an integral part of the rhetorical campaign. I became interested in this, um, especially when I first saw Dan Savage and Terry Miller's video, because I was just so shocked that so many videos were coming in very quickly. And I became notified of this um, by reading the news and right as it was happening. Um, and just so many videos were coming in, and I watched these videos, and I also thought, why do people believe these videos? You know, I don't know these people on this video telling me that life will improve, but why would anyone believe them? And so I wanted to figure out what made it so persuasive. So in my dissertation, um, I seek to avoid just describing the It Gets Better phenomenon. Instead, I want to critically evaluate the rhetorical and technological strategies that have enabled this to become such a wide-reaching, persuasive campaign. Not only is there, are there tons of videos available, there's a book, there's an MTV movie, there's about to be another MTV movie, there's been talks of a musical. Um, there, I want to see how that's going to play out. Um, Dan Savage has gone around and has been speaking at numerous schools. Uh, he, it's got to the point where he can't handle all of the information that comes in. And every, they're just, and there's other projects that have come or been influenced or have responded to this project, uh, like the Make It Better project. So it's become more than just one video. It is now really spread out there. And I wanted to know why. Like, how does this happen? Um, how do we persuade people that what we're saying using personal experiences is true? So, what I conclude in my dissertation is that there's an interdependent relationship between the rhetorical situation of the project and the medium in which the message is presented. The project relies on unconventional strategies in order to overcome the rhetorical problems that the LGBT population faces and faced at the time of the creation. Um, they seek to overcome the communicative and the ideological constraints that have hindered a message like this coming forth before. I specifically I conclude that by using what is called a feminine style of communicating, the Igus Better discourse uses the parameters of YouTube in order to empower their audiences. So in short, what I'm saying is that it is with YouTube that the message becomes enhanced. The message is the primary focus of my dissertation, but I do not feel like I can ignore the medium in which it's presented as well. Um, I also, in, at the end of my dissertation, look at the uh, ideological implications of this message as well. A lot of presentations I've seen about the Aegis Better Project have focused on how this is very positive and it's very good and um, it, you know, there's a lot of altruism and good feelings with it. 
and it's positive. But I think that we have to delve deeper into it and look at it more critically in that what I argue is it sets up um, a sense of homonormativity, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end of the presentation. So what I'm briefly going to do is I'm going to explain a couple of my theories very briefly, because no one wants to sit here listening necessarily to theories. Um, and then I'll get into the first part of my analysis, which is the first video of Dan and Ted, um, Terry, excuse me. So in the communication scholarship, uh, we have this, and I think in many other disciplines, we have this theory called the rhetorical situation, uh, which was created by Lloyd Bitzer. And Lloyd Bitzer said that a work of rhetoric is pragmatic. It comes into being for some reason. Um, so rhetorical situations are instances in which communication is invited to accomplish a specific aim. So it requires rhetoric to address these exigencies, these situations, or these problems that are being that are capable of being altered by discourse. And in every rhetorical situation, there exists communicative constraints or those um, problems that can uh, hinder communication from coming forth or it can hinder the type of strategy being used or it can also enhance it and enable it so that constraint can be used to um, achieve a particular goal. In every rhetorical situation there also is a rhetorical audience and these are not just mere listeners, people who are listening um, to the discourse being presented. These are people that believe that they can um, alter communication, that they um, can be agents of change, is what Bitzer calls them. Now, identifying the rhetorical situation is of particular importance to my project in that I believe by looking at the necessity of the It Gets Better project, um, the constraints that were imposed upon Dan Savage, Terry, Terry Miller, and later other rhetors, and the audience with whom the campaign is intended for, it provides a better rationale for why they used the rhetorical and technological strategies that they did. So why they were choosing um, to present this message in the manner that they did. Um, the rhetorical situation of Savage and Miller and other rhetors calls for and requires the speaker to find rhetorical resources that create a truth um, that is not based in scientific fact, but instead is based in experiential knowledge. So in the case of the It Gets Better campaign, the premise of the videos is to offer a true account of what it means to identify as an alternative sexuality in a society that privileges heterosexuality. So the crux of the campaign is dependent upon the intended audience, and the intended audience are those LGBT youth who are desperate for support. So they exist in spaces in which they do not have that support. And it's dependent upon them believing in these personal messages of truth. Because think about it, if you are a youth who is being bullied day in and day out for being gay or for being LGBT and identifying such or being believed that you are identifying as such, then it would be difficult in which to watch a video from a stranger and say, okay, I can put up with the daily bullying, the social sanctions, because you are telling me as an adult that when I get to where you are, I will become successful, I will become happy, and everything will be okay, so this will be all worth it. Uh, that would be particularly hard for a youth to, who is being bullied day in and day out to believe in that. But in order for the expensive message to work, they have to believe in it. You know, in order to say, okay, I will survive present day because the future will be better, they have to believe in what is being told to them. There's not necessarily scientific fact that could be given, or maybe there is, but it wouldn't be necessarily as persuasive, especially when you're facing daily pains, like a lot of LGBT youth do. So to believe in a narrative of such possibility that the future will improve is difficult for several reasons. First, the entire premise of the Agus Better message is that LGBT adults will talk about their own personal experiences of struggle and perseverance and they will serve as living proof that the youth could survive that present day pain. So to serve as living proof based upon experiential knowledge, they have to come across as if they are legitimate, as if they have really experienced that. But how does one prove that legitimacy and that membership within a group that is not easily recognizable? And what I mean by that is, 
while all identities are capable of skepticism, sexuality is more difficult to prove than markers like race or gender. And there is some argument for that, and I understand that, but sexuality can be hidden. You can conceal sexuality. You can go for a very long time without anyone knowing your sexuality. Um, and so what these retors have to do is they have to find a way in which they can convince the people that they don't know but that are watching them that what they're saying is true and that they are a member and they do identify as gay. The second difficulty is, that they face, like a rhetorical problem, is that LGBT youth are surrounded by evidence that contradicts the It Gets Better message. I mean, the It Gets Better campaign was created during a spate of suicides in which youth who are constantly online were seeing news story after news story after news story after news story in a matter of 14 days of LGBT youth committing suicide. So these might have been people like them that were experiencing things like them. So they're surrounded by evidence that absolutely goes against what the It Gets Better campaign is saying. So the It Gets Better Retors, Dan Savage, Sherry Miller in particular, have to somehow get over that rhetorical constraint and say, I know that you see evidence to the contrary all around you, but believe us. The third rhetorical constraint is that LGBT individuals have been historically situated as subservient to the heterosexual population. So to interact and engage with similar others typically requires that LGBT people meet in privacy, that they gain permission from those in authority, which they rarely ever are in authority, or find an accessible space not governed by powerful others. So the It Gets Better project is focusing on a particular part of the LGBT population, youth who are desperate to find support because they do not have a space in which this message is already created, it's already available. So they're focused on that audience in particular. And they have to somehow get around the rules that exist in which says you can speak to LGBT youth or you can't speak to LGBT youth. So they have to find an accessible space in which they can give this message of hope, that they can be legitimate, they can show, be authorities of experience, and they don't have to gain permission. So that is the, those are the rhetorical constraints that Dance of Savage and Tara Miller are going up against. Um, quickly, because of time, I'll talk a little bit about the feminine style. Um, the feminine style is a communication style that uh, some rhetorical scholars crafted and, um, or developed and started to see when they started to study women's communication. In that women often are not, or in the past, were not given um, a lot of space in which to talk. You know, they were supposed to be in the private sphere, not the public sphere. Um, and so when women did uh, get to talk, or they went against the forces and the authorities to talk, um, they sometimes would adapt the masculine style of speaking, which at that time privileged r rational reasoning, evidence um, based on sci scientific fact, authority, expertise. And what happened is um, some women it contradicted their natural way of speaking. Or they got, uh, uh, they got um, criticized for uh, using this masculine form of communication that made them seem um, cold, and made them seem hard, you know, so it wasn't accessible. So women adapted um, by using this feminine rhetorical style. And the feminine rhetorical style is based on um, a personal tone. You know, if there's one thing that characterizes it, I believe it's the personal tone, in which personal stories and narratives are used, um, general, generalizations and arguments come out of uh, instant by instant situations. Um, there's calls for audience participation, so identification between a speaker and an audience becomes very important. Audience members are addressed as if they're peers, as if they then too have authority based upon experience. So there's a lot of authority given to experience in this personal tone. And what I argue is that the rhetorical problems that Savage and Miller and then later other LGBT rhetors um, faced 
was that they adapted to it by using this feminine rhetorical style. And it's important to note that feminine rhetorical style is not just for women to use. Now, while scholarship started with it by looking at women, it is not just biological. Okay, it's called feminine rhetorical style, but it, it really is just characteristics of this communication style. But because they were um, facing marginalized ideologies, lack of access, concealable identities, and this really powerful heterosexist normative narrative, they had to adapt in some way in order to prove themselves authority.